Hello, everyone. Welcome. We're going to have a great program. We really are. You do want to stay tuned. If you like music, because we have an internationally known, world-class violinist with us today, Jamie George. He has played for dignitaries, heads of state. He's with us, but now he's also played in thatched roofed churches. His parents taught him a lot about humility. We'll probably talk about that. But we are so thrilled to have Jamie with us. Yes, and you know, he really is an evangelist. Yes, he is. And he just plays the violin, um, which he's been doing since he was five years old. Um, but he really loves God and wants to see everyone saved that listens to every string of that violin. So right now he's starting out singing Chris, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. Beautiful, Jamie. That music is great. <laughs> and he, and I had 
very seldom mention this on the air, but I've been to Cuba, and uh, we were in for a treat as we really talked to this great evangelist, and he's secondarily a violin player. Yes. God bless you. Thank you. So good to have you with us, Jamie. It's a privilege, really, to be here with you. Oh, it's our privilege. Tell us about life as a five-year-old child in Cuba. I think it was pretty good. Our parents shielded us from what was really going on. We grew up, my sister and I, in a home where we were taught to give God the glory, to put God first, to obey God rather than men. And so as we faced pressures from the outside world, we were quite shielded by our parents. I think they gave us the best that they could give us. Uh, they knew, but they kept you from knowing. That's right. That's yeah. right. Well, how long had Castro been in when you were that young at five? So it had been about 10 years because he came uh, to power just at the end of 1959, December 31. Oh, really? That uh, early? 1959, so basically 1960. So we had now been uh, under this, or my parents and the rest of the country, for 10 years. So things were sort of like falling into <coughs> place for what they wanted to do in terms of the education programs, which are really meant to program the yeah. young people. Yeah. You yeah. know, they say it's free education, but there are no pencils and no notebooks and very few books and they say there's free health care but there's hardly any anesthesia any antibiotics uh, x-ray machines are broken uh, so you, you've really paid for it already when you make 20 25 30 dollars a month they've taken 99 percent of your taxes out um, so we just didn't know anything different yeah. um, my dad was the one that had been trying to leave cuba uh, from the moment he said he realized what was happening, what was coming, uh, and it wasn't until 10 years later that the Lord opened the doors for my family to come to this country. And how did he open the doors? Well, my, my father um, wrote a letter to uh, Mr. Castro and said, we are Christians, we are persecuted for our faith. Uh, many Christians are uh, sent to jail, uh, sent to forced labor camps, um, many Christians do not want to go to the army to bear arms, to go to war, that kind of thing. Uh, and we are really no good to you here. And I wonder if you would consider just letting me and my family leave. Um, sort of that was the undertone of the letter. But you weren't supposed to ever write a letter like that because yeah. you, you, you weren't supposed to want to leave the utopia of socialism and communism. <laughs> and people had gone to jail for simply requesting such a thing. So and he was really stepping out, wasn't he? It was a huge risk, but more than a risk, it was a leap of faith on his part. He felt impressed to do that, and somebody came to our house one evening to ask my dad. I think they were shocked that he had asked such a thing. He, he came to ask my dad, did you write this letter? And my dad said, yes. He said, well, we are studying your case, your situation, and not long ago, uh, not long after that, they came back and said, um, if, if you can work it out, if you can find a country that is willing to take you in, we will not stand in the way. So he had to do everything. He had to find the sponsors. He had to find the country. He had to do all of the things that were required from both ends, another yeah. country's and our country, to be able to leave. Wow. And somebody from this country, he began writing mm -hmm. letters. He started sending them out. Uh, asking people for help. He wrote to people he knew and he wrote to strangers saying, would you help us? And somebody here from the United States uh, responded, was willing to do everything that it took. You had to sponsor, you had to pay, you had to guarantee. We had to have medical exams, interviews, all kinds of things wow. from the Cuban end and from the U.S. end. Um, and then finally, several months later, close to a year the process took, um, everything was all set and in place, and we left during what's known as the Mariel Boat Lift. Yes. When all of those tens of thousands of people came in 1980, that's when they let out also a few hundred or a few thousand quote-unquote religious refugees 
they called them. They let Christians out, yeah. and we were part of that group. We were among the last few groups that ever left wow. Cuba in 1980. We came here in December. Mm. So they didn't want the Christians praying. Absolutely. Because your prayers make a difference. They Absolutely. didn't realize what they were doing. They were trying to, I think, let Christians leave, just get them out of here. They were yeah. troublemakers. They would not, they would not go along with what they said and what they wanted, you know. And so they, they figured maybe if we could let as many of them go as possible, then we won't have that many or any Christians left here in the country. Hmm. But many stayed to continue to preach the gospel in Cuba, which wow. was a great sacrifice. Yeah. Yes. You know? So that's that was basically. And how did our story. you get your first violin? Um, so when, when I was about two or three, my mother purchased a little plastic saxophone for me with eight keys. And before I learned how to play classical music, I learned how to play Jesus Loves Me and other church songs because we went to church every week. Um, and so I started picking out little simple tunes on that plastic saxophone. So that's when my mother realized this boy has some kind of musical ability Yes. So then at the age of five, she took me to my very first violin lesson with the concertmaster of the symphony orchestra in the city that we lived. And that was it. Not only was that it in terms of me uh, playing the violin uh, and staying with that instrument, I didn't have a choice. She forced me to practice <laughs> every day for the next 15 years. When I tried to quit, she would say, you can't quit. God has given you a talent. The day you leave this house, you can do whatever you want, but as long as you live in my house, you're going to have to practice the violin. You're so glad now, aren't you? I'm very thankful, very thankful. And now that I have students, it's one of the things that I've done during the pandemic is teach violin lessons, and I've got about 30 of them. Now <clears throat> I try to do the same thing, challenge and motivate the young people and the parents. Because sometimes the parents will say, well, what should I do? He doesn't want to practice. She doesn't want to practice. And I said, who's the parent here and who's the child? Who knows what, what is good for the, for the child, them or you? Encourage them, motivate them, force them to practice, you know? So um, I'm very thankful to my mom and my dad who enforced the rules, you know? Yeah, he was the enforcer. That's right. I got to uh, taste the belt <laughs> and the shoe a couple of times uh, when I didn't want to practice. So. Um, Thanks to them, obviously God for the talent he gave me, but my mom's perseverance um, and unwillingness to just give up, I, this is what I get to do, to, yeah. to share the gospel with others. Yeah. What a, and what it's a such a story. blessing to us to get to hear it. Oh, thank you. Praise God. <laughs> and when did you start playing when you left the, to the United States? When did you start playing for other people? Well, at seven, I had my very first concert. Really? Um, really? I had a classical training, and I believe that the first piece I played was a very classic uh, piece, which is the first movement, or part of the Bach double violin concerto. Um, and so I didn't have a second violin. It was just me playing the first violin. And my mother, who's a pianist, uh, she played the piano for me. And so I think that was my first public performance uh, and then uh, once I got here and I started taking lessons, of course, they found, whether it was at church or my teacher at recitals or concerts or um, other opportunities, ways for me to play in front of people. And I'll, I'll have to say, that's what made it worth all the practicing. When young people practice and practice and practice and that's all they do, you don't, you don't find an outlet. You don't say, oh man, this was great. But when you hear people come up to you and say, that was wonderful. I was really blessed by that. I was really touched. Those are the things that kind of keep you going right. when you're frustrated, when you're disappointed, when you're discouraged, you know, when you're down. So it's important to get our young people opportunities for them to share their talents with others so they can see the fruit of their labor and their work. Yeah. Now all this started in led to over 60 million miles? Six, in it? Six million. <laughs> yes. Um, you know, flying makes the world a small place now. Yeah. And the violin doesn't have any language barriers. Whether I'm playing in Japan, in China, in Germany, in Russian, everybody understands what that violin is saying. 
So I don't need a translator. Music is the international language. Yeah. And so I've had the opportunity to go to many, many places and countries around the world to use music as a way to gain people's attention and interest and then share the gospel and Jesus with them. Praise right. God. Well, how did you get involved in Life Centers of America? Um, their uh, corporate and national headquarters are in Cleveland, Tennessee, which, which is just up the oh. road from the Chattanooga area where I live. Yeah, and, and they're I still used, in Chattanooga. They, yes, correct. And um, they used to hire a harpist, a Christian harpist by the name of Greg Buchanan um, to come and do a number of their events. And the harp is a very soothing, beautiful instrument, you know. And one year um, they called and Greg was not available. And that was the guy that they went to. And so our booking agent, we shared the same one, said, well, Greg's not available, but I've got this young man that actually just lives down the road from you guys that plays the violin. And they were like, well, uh, we don't know. You know, the violin, is he going to put them to sleep playing the Tchaikovsky or Beethoven violin concerto or something like that? And she's like, no, he's actually pretty good. And, and, and he shares a bit of his story and blah, blah, blah. Anyway, they gave me a try and I've had the privilege now of doing dozens uh, and dozens of events for them um, and recording pro, uh, music for their Alzheimer's uh, program and, and oh, really? commercials and things of that nature. So Well, I thought wonderful. you said you got to share your faith. Yes, yes. And you like that, don't you? Absolutely. <laughs> one, of the, one of the most lucrative gigs I ever had was after 9-11. And I would say that this is a Fortune 5 or 10 company. And they invited me, and like I said, they paid me more money than I've ever been paid to do two shows for them. But the first thing they said was, you can't talk about God, you can't talk about faith, just entertain them and have a good time, you know. Mm. And so I couldn't share the kind of music that I normally share, even though I'm classically trained and I can play, you know, just about anything except jazz, because Jazz is pretty specialized, and, and if you don't start early, it's hard to pick up on that. But I can play just about anything else. Um, so I, I played, you know, love songs and Broadway and, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, but when I left, even with that big check that I had in my hand, I just felt empty because I had not really, I had entertained them. I hadn't, I hadn't inspired them. I hadn't motivated, challenged them, you know. But even, even then, as I went to greet people, they would stop. Some of them would say, you're a believer, aren't you? I can just tell. I can just tell in your music, you know. And so it, it reminded me that I want to use the talent that God gave me to share the love of Jesus with others. I don't want to just entertain people. Was that Coca-Cola's Salute to America? That's you're it. You're referring to? Yes. Yes. So this is what I am passionate about. Uh, I'm passionate about letting people know that the answer is not in you. The answer is not with you. The answer is Jesus Christ, the hope, the assurance, our salvation. Amen. And you get to share that wherever you go. That's right. So after that salute to America, and that was like around 9-11, right? It is that was, why they did it? Yes. The, you know, the morale of, uh, of, of the country, I think, oh, was, was down. So down. People were, uh, it, you know, it was like we were staggered as a country yeah. that this could happen. Um, and I think they were trying to do things to, to boost the morale and the energy level of their employees and make them feel good. And it was wonderful. I mean, I played patriotic music, um, like I said, songs that everybody knows and recognizes and loves. Um, but I just felt like I wanted to do a little bit more than just, you know, put on a nice show for people. Yeah. So I have chosen not to go into that type of yeah. entertainment. Because it's uh, not your heart. It, it's not exactly right. Hmm. You went through a really rough time in your life with the linear scleroderma. Mm -hmm. Scleroderma. It's Tell an, us about that. It's an auto. You're fine now. You look fine. By the grace of God. Yeah. But yes, in 1990, I was diagnosed with an autoimmune disease, um, and that disease is called scleroderma. There are a few different types. Um, scleroderma, when I was diagnosed, was pretty much a death sentence. There was no cure for it. And it would spread systemically throughout your body, affecting joints, muscles, and organs, so that when it went to your heart, 
your heart would harden and you would eventually die. But I was in the 10% of people who did not have this disease manifest and spread systemically. It stayed in one area, that's why it's called linear, because it's in a line. Uh -huh. And it was right here. It came down my forehead and into the side of my nose and my cheek, and it did a lot of damage. It went into the muscle tissue and it ate the muscle. It went into my, bone, my skull bone and ate into the, so I looked like I had run into a pole or the side of a sharp wall or something. Mm. Um, but by the grace of God, after five years, the disease went away and I had a reconstructive surgery to put you know, my forehead back together and even it out kind of thing and the skin tone the same and all of that. And the doctor said I would have a relapse every seven years and like a clock every seven years it comes back. But whereas before it literally did this to my face, now what it does is it just kind of scratches it a little bit and then it goes away after a while. So I'm very, very thankful. Um, and I believe that God used that to wake me up. And I was starting to play for important people, for tens of thousands of people at a time. And what happened to me at 19 years old, I started thinking, yeah, I'm pretty good. You know, this is just the start. I deserve this, I've earned this. And I started focusing away from God and from Christ. And I started looking at myself too much. And I think God allowed this to happen so that I could say, wait a minute, who gave me the talent? Who gave me the gift? Yeah. Who should I be focusing on and who should I give the glory to? So and your mother thankful. would be proud. <laughs> yes, she, she was very concerned, obviously, because they never told me that I could die from this. So they prayed and prayed and prayed. Uh, and eventually, you know, uh, it was found out that I had the least benign uh, oh, of all the forms God. of scleroderma by the grace of God. Imagine if it went to my fingers. Yeah. Fingers yeah. stop working. They don't, your, your muscles, your joints just dry up kind of thing. So I'm very, very thankful and very blessed. Amen. Well, do you have another song? Well, I've got many, you? whatever you want. <laughs> okay. Absolutely, I've got another song. Well, because <laughs> we're going to have you play another one. Okay, you got it. All right, right after this break.
Wow. Well, we're going to have Jamie songs. come over and talk about depression. Now, he, you, you would think he, there's nothing in this world that will bother him. But in 2003, 2004, he went through a difficult time. Probably the most difficult and painful uh, period of my life because when God brings two people together, um, He means for that to be a symbol of the relationship that we have with Him. Yes. And when a divorce, a breakup, a separation takes place, uh, there's a lot of a lot of pain, and so. Um, I grew up being taught that divorce was not an option, that when you said, I do, um, that it was for the rest of your life. Um, and yet things happen, unfortunately, in this world that we live in. Uh, and so I had to deal with that pain. I had to deal with, you know, uh, um, the, the separation, the disappointment that I caused God, my family, my friends. Um, and it took a long time. It took, it took years, I think. Um, and I got to the point where I thought I'm never going to get married. In fact, I told my mother six years later uh, at a Mother's Day lunch that we had. I took her out to uh, celebrate Mother's Day. I said, I'm going to marry my violin. <laughs> she doesn't talk back, only when I tell her to, and she has nice curves. <laughs> And she said, you know, son, you can do whatever you want, but don't limit God if he wants to do something else in your life. Mm. Wow. And I just figured, you know, I'm going to dedicate my life, my energies, my attention on, you know, music and the music ministry. Um, but it was when I got to the point where God was truly number one in my life that he then said, I've got something better than you could have ever imagined. <laughs> really? Um, and yeah, you lost weight, didn't you? Yes. I will tell you that my weight sort of goes up and down like a yo-yo because <laughs> of traveling. And where, when you're on the road and you get there at 10 o'clock at night, you haven't eaten all day, uh, and you go eat, you know, those, those pounds go straight to <laughs> here. Uh, and now I have a wife who's a fitness guru. Uh, and she's into exercising and eating healthy. And always has been. Yes, yes. So she's got me now in the straight and narrow. Um, but, you know, there's that little, when I go on tour uh, or spend a few weeks away from home, I don't eat all the organic or free range or cage free things. Yeah, that that's she, what we you know. free range. <laughs> yes. Organic. Yes. Um, so I've been very, very blessed in many areas um, with. Uh, Rochelle that, that God brought for me and me for her. Um, and so uh, during this pandemic, I would say that one of the greatest blessings, and at times I feel like there have been very few, because I just had to stop doing concerts and travel and, and, and stop doing what I, what I love to do and what God has called me to do. But I'm so thankful that we have such a wonderful marriage and relationship that we've spent so much great time, quality time together. And you had more time with her, didn't you? Absolutely, for, yeah. for weeks and months. And you um, talk about her in the book. Yes. Wow, she was a fitness guru, that is for sure. She was. I wow. did, do not want to mess with her. <laughs> uh, I promised God before we got married that I would always do everything she says. <laughs> and she says, if you ask her, for the most part, that's true. Um, she was a professional football player. I didn't even she know that. She was the lineman. A but she linebacker. had a great figure. I mean, she was... Yes, um, yes. Well, she worked very hard and she ate, you know, healthy. So um, she took care of herself. And our beautiful. bodies are a temp the temple of, of, of the Holy Spirit, says the, the Word of God. And so she took that very seriously. Um, she was a linebacker and a running back, was a menace, a legend in her day. Uh, her, her signature move was the stiff arm. Uh, and I experienced the stiff arm <laughs> off the field at first, if you know what I mean. But then in God's perfect timing, we came together. Um, and our, her desire is to challenge people. And she does travel with me about one weekend a month. Prior to the pandemic, I, I am on the road 50 weekends a year. Oh, um, my goodness. Doing concerts. I'm home Thanksgiving and Christmas, uh, and that's it. 
and she travels with me one week in a month. And when I introduce her and I share her story and then she speaks and shares, she has a passion for challenging people to live a healthy uh, life, joyful life, so that they can serve God with all of their energy. And when you're tired, when you're worn out, when you're sick, you can't do that to the best of your ability. Right. Yeah. But we want to hold your book up. It's called Crescendo with Jamie George. And it is got some amazing stories, funny mm. stories. Sad I mean, stories. <clears throat> sad stories, yeah. But it is a really good book. It's hard to put down. Actually, it's Thank the kind you. of book I like to read. Because <laughs> you get to find out about somebody's life. And everybody has their ups and downs. That's right. I remember when you know we were putting it together that uh, some of the folks editing the book and so forth, because it is an autobiography. I pretty yeah. much wrote it. I'd be driving down the road and talking into a little tape recorder or, or recording device of some sort and then transcribe it. They were like, you know, well, maybe this story you shouldn't really put in there. And I said, well, they need to know that I am a human being and I've made mistakes yeah. like, like other people have too. The Bible doesn't just have the great stories about <laughs> David, you know. Yeah. Um, even Isaiah uh, lost his faith. Uh, Elijah. They, they all struggled. Elijah at one point said to God, I don't want to live anymore. He was so disappointed. Yeah. Um, I, I want people to realize that if they look at me, if they look at you or anybody else, they're going to be disappointed at some point. Right. We need to focus on yeah. Jesus. Well, it's good you had those stories. But now you also had really neat stories. You've played with Larnell Harris. Oh my You've goodness. You've played at the Lincoln Center. Yes. You have played, but you also played in thatched roofed churches. Yes. You didn't just play for the dignitaries and the heads of state, but what was one of your favorite people that loved the Lord that you played with? Some of your favorites. Larnell? Well, Larnell, I consider to be the greatest gospel singer of all time. Um, He's an incredible artist, musician, and a wonderful gentleman as well, yeah. who lives his faith. Um, another one I would have to say is Michael Card. Um, deep theologian, great songs he's written. Um, and it's just been a learning experience and a growing experience for me to be around some of these guys um, who have had such not only successful careers on human levels and, and, and terms, but I think in God's eyes, which is really yes. what's more important than anything else. Right. Um, so I, I've said for a long time that I try to work with, surround myself, get to know people that are much more talented, much better than I am, so that I could learn and I could be challenged and I can grow uh, as well. But yes, of course, when you get to play for a head of state or somebody who's royalty or this and that, uh, it, it's fun, but when you walk into a church and people walk in in bare feet, uh, you're reminded yeah. that it's not about the nice clothes yeah. and the bright lights and the you know applause and this and that, that it is about those people. It is about sharing the love of Jesus with anybody and everybody so that they can have the opportunity to give their hearts to the Lord and know that there is something that awaits all of us far better yes. than anything we could have here on Amen. earth. Because that is your heart. And I want to get this in. Is that why you liked working with Dr. Frank Gonzalez so much? Yes, absolutely. An incredibly brilliant man, right? Somebody who can, who can study theology and really understand it, but also who can put it on a plain level for people to understand. Because there are biblical themes and concepts that are challenging yeah. and, and things that have happened. Why would they happen here and they seem to be okay? And why did they happen here and are completely not okay? You know, um, and so once again, to have the privilege of working with and knowing pastors and preachers who really live their faith and people is a great inspiration and challenge to me. Amen. I want to ask you about going to Cuba, and we'll go back to Cuba. Mm -hmm. uh, how did you get in there as often as you did? Well, uh, up until about four or five years ago, in order for you to go to Cuba, you had to have a license from the Treasury Department. Uh, 
Office of Foreign Assets Control, I think, OFAC. From, from there. here. Oh, from, from here. here. They will let you in. It's because of the embargo that it, it was restricted, and it still yeah. is on, on some levels, to go to Cuba. Officially, you're not supposed to go to Cuba for tourist purposes even yeah. now. So you had to have a license. You had to have permission from the Treasury Department. And who would typically have a license like that? Organizations that are going to Cuba to do humanitarian or missionary, you know, outreach type programs. And so I was able to, for those reasons, be able to travel. But then I had something else that I had to deal with, which is the Cuban side, the Cuban government. When I was 10, they offered me a scholarship to go to the Tchaikovsky Conservatory of Music in Moscow. Full ride. The only condition was that I renounce my faith in Jesus. Wow. Mm. Because to be a communist means that you have to be an atheist. No. A communist cannot believe in God. It's, it's, it's just not a part of the philosophy, not part of the ideology. And so I was only 10, but my parents had taught me, as it says in the Word of God, that it is better to obey God rather than men. And so I'm standing there looking at this tall gentleman who's offering what seems to be the opportunity of a lifetime. And I said, I'm not going to do that. I am not going to renounce my faith in God for any opportunity. And he laughed. He, he looked at me and said, you are a fool. You will never be anything. You're trading God, something that, something that doesn't exist, you know, mm. for this. How um, sad. I never saw that man again. But I, I believe that in Romans 8, 28, as it says, all things work together for good to those that love God. Yes. It doesn't mean that everything is always going to work out the way we want. Right. Okay? Because this is a world full of pain and suffering and hatred and discord. Yeah. But in the end, and in the end could be 10 years, it could be 20 years, it could be 15 minutes from now. But only God knows what that end is going to be. Well, let me ask you something while we're talking about Cuba. Can you share on the air that story about, about um, you having to sit at the airport Oh. Can you share that story? Yes. <laughs> it's so funny. So when you go to Cuba to do religious activities, I don't know if you still have to, but back then you had to have a religious license. Uh, sorry, a religious visa. And that visa has to be obtained by a church or a denomination in Cuba. And so you get that visa. When you get there, you have to go to customs or immigration and tell them, I am here, somebody outside has my visa. So, I mean, talk about archaic and, 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 and you know, yeah. challenging. Then they send somebody outside when you walk through customs where everybody's waiting and somebody says, is there somebody here with the visa for this and such and yeah. such a person? Yes, yes, I'm here. So then they turn in the visa, that person runs back to immigration and you're standing there in the corner and then they process, you know, your papers. So when I arrived, the organization that was supposed to have my visa, the gentleman had forgotten and was in bed. So I'm coming in the last flight. You're tired? It's 10 o'clock at night. You've been traveling? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and basically they said, your visa's not here, the person didn't show up. You're gonna have to spend the night sleeping on the floor here at the airport, a granite floor or whatever it was. And then tomorrow morning when that person shows up, then we'll get your visa. Luckily, I have a wonderful friend that I grew up with by the name of Luis, who my friends that were fly, uh, flying with me, traveling with me, they left the airport or walked out of customs and they told my friend Luis what was going on. And Luis then literally raised a raucous. And, and he sent, went and got that visa and he went and got from that, that visa. man and came back and they were shutting down the airport. They were turning off the lights and leaving. And he said to one of the guards, he said, what's going on? He said, well, we're done. He said, there's somebody in there. He's gonna have to stay till tomorrow. And he says, do you have any idea who's in there? That guy is an international violinist who's come here to play for government officials and this and that. If you guys don't let him out of the airport, you're gonna be manning a tower in, in, in Alaska, you know, in 24 hours and all of a sudden, I'm already laying on the, on, on the floor there um, waiting just to go to sleep. The lights come on. Everybody starts running to their positions, their posts, customs, immigration, <laughs> security, baggage. 
And then, sir, sir, Mr. George, please come over here. Here, we got your visa. And just like that, they never even searched my bags. You know what that's like. <laughs> yeah. um, they just kicked, literally kicked me out of there. So well, uh, God a has a sense story. of humor. <laughs> <laughs> Did you know who was in there on that floor? Well, I had a similar experience. But God just, for some reason, when I went to Cuba, and, and we went there, to do religious work, mm -hmm. I carried in the Jesus film mm -hmm. that uh, was done uh, by who? Who did that? Uh, no, who did that? Yeah, you do. It's from Orlando. Yeah. Anyway, I brought that in. The other people with me, and there was only four of us brought in the the projector projector the um generator brought in the the screen show it <coughs> and and then the film itself and well, you the, had the film. and then i <coughs> had the film mm. and so when i went in to the customs First of all, they come out with machine guns. <laughs> to greet you. <laughs> to greet, that was my greeting. Because <laughs> you're welcome. Uh, machine guns. And when I went in, because we had to go through different aisles, and uh, I went in, and the fellow looked at me and turned away and went some other place. And I just wow. walked straight through. And that goes against every part of their training. Everything they're ever taught, you know, is to watch like a hawk. So turning away could only be God. interpreted as God literally putting his hand on that situation so you could walk through. All right, well, walk well. through and then the others the same. They got through too. They got through and we come to find out that how they got through is they thought we were with the Pan Am games mm. at that time and let us through and amazing. <laughs> and we didn't know where to go mm -hmm. because the person who was supposed to meet us was not there and sure on and on and on. Incredible. Praise the Lord. <laughs> well, it's time to take a break. You oh. have more music for us? I think I do. Oh, yes. <laughs> okay. Here's Jamie George. More music. <laughs> <laughs> Did you know CTN has a Roku channel? That's right, you can now stream CTN content directly to your television without the need for cable or satellite. Simply add our channel to your Roku lineup and you're ready to go. We're streaming 24 hours a day to bring you the quality Christian programming you've come to expect from CTN. Look for CTN on Roku today. Every project is a process. And in his working on us, God has a purpose and plan. His workmanship can be seen in the details of what Jesus has done through us. So walk in his process. Find your purpose.
Well, this, here's the book. Find it and you'll be enjoying it and give it to somebody else. Um, we don't just want you to know that Jamie didn't come here to play music. He, we want to talk about God and he wants to talk about God. And the only thing that we're going to talk about is God. Because he's the one, the only one, that can come into your life and make you over and new. True. Ask God to forgive you of all your sins. He is a marvelous God. He does the incredible for us. So today, we just ask that you would bow your head and say, Jesus, come into my life. Yes. Come into my heart. Make me over anew. In Jesus' name. God bless you all.